I've talked about a universe of elementary functions filled with interesting examples. I've done a brief review of various properties of functions, giving a language to help describe how functions behave. In this video, I want to talk about how to put different functions together, the operations on functions. First, functions output numbers, and I can do arithmetic on numbers. Therefore, I can do arithmetic on functions. If f and g are two functions, I can do both functions, run both machines, and then add together the results, or I could subtract the results, or I can multiply the two results, or divide them, or even use one as the exponent for the other. These are all called pointwise operations. The name reflects the fact that they happen at each value, at each point of the function. I always do the two functions first and then act on the results. However, there is another important way to combine functions together. If I think of a function as a machine, pointwise operations mean that I take the same input and run it through both machines separately before I do something to these outputs, add, subtract, whatever. However, instead of doing both machines separately, I can do them in sequence. I can use one machine, then take the output of that machine and use it as the input for the next machine. This is called composition, doing one function after another, one function inside another. There are two common notations, one using this hollow circle and one actually writing the function g inside the function f. In each case, the function g is the function that acts first, the inside function or the function on the right. The circle notation is a bit strange since we usually read from left to right. However, thinking of functions as actors, as machines, the g will act first because it is next to the variable, the first machine to see it. Hopefully that explains the notation a little. For composition, I will often refer to the inside and the outside functions. I find these really useful terms to describe what is going on. Here are some examples. I'll take two functions, an exponential and a quadratic. In the composition of f with g, g is the inside function, so the quadratic happens first. Then I put the output, the x squared plus 1, as an input into the outside function, the exponential. This means that the variable x in e to the x is replaced with x squared plus 1, the whole output of the first function. The result is e to the x squared plus 1, where the whole expression x squared plus 1 is in the exponent. I can also compose the other way around. In g compose f, f is the inside function, so I do the exponential first. Then g says to square and add 1. So I take the output of the exponential, square it, and add 1 to produce the composition. Sometimes I have to construct compositions, but often a function is already the composition of various pieces, and I need to simply recognize the fact to work with the function. Here's a function h. I would like to write it as the com composition f compose g with f the outside function and g the inside function. How do I do that? Well, I look at the structure of h. h has a square root and then an addition inside. The square root happens to be the whole rest of the function, so I can treat the square root as the outside. Inside the square root, all that happens is taking the variable and adding 7. So the inside is adding 7. In symbols, the outside f of x is square root x, and the inside is x plus 7. Note again in the notation f compose g that the inside g happens first. I talked a little, about, a little bit about inversion when I talked about trig and exponential inverses a couple of videos ago, but let me now talk in general about function inverses. To invert a function is to undo whatever it did, to do the machine backwards. The notation is f with a superscript negative 1. This is a bit of a problematic notation since it looks like a reciprocal. This notation does not mean 1 over f of x. It is not a reciprocal. Instead, the property we are looking for can be expressed by composition. If I compose with the inverse, I get the original variable back. If I do f, then f inverse, or f inverse and then f, nothing should change. f compose f inverse of x should just give x. Here are some inversions. 
If the function f multiplies a variable by 3, then the inverse will divide by 3. If I do both, the 3s cancel out and just the variable remains. If the function square roots x and then the inverse squares x, then again if I do both, the square and the square root cancel each other out and only the variable remains. The reciprocal function f of x over 1 over x is an interesting case. It is its own inverse, since if I flip something twice, I get back what I started with. Inverses are very important for solving with functions. Say I have an exponential function in an equation like e to the x equals y, and let's say that I want to solve for x, I want the variable x to be isolated. I need to get rid of the exponential on the left. However, I can't just divide by e since e is the base of an exponential. The only way to get rid of the exponential function is to use its inverse. The inverse of the exponential is the logarithm using base e so this inverse is the natural logarithm. I apply the natural logarithm to both sides. By equality, I can apply the same operation to both sides of an equation, of course. Then, on the left, I have the composition of the logarithm and the exponential. These are inverses of each other, so they cancel each other off, and I get the equation x equals natural logarithm of y. This is the only way to solve with an exponential. Use its inverse, the logarithm, to get rid of the exponential. Similarly, if I have sine x equals y and I want to isolate the x variable, I need to get rid of the sine function. Again, I can't just divide it away or anything since it is a function acting on x. The only way to get rid of it is through its inverse, arcsine. I apply the arcsine function to both sides of the equation. On the left, I have the composition of sine and arcsine. These are inverses, so they cancel each other out, and I get the equation x equals arcsine of y. This is the only way to get rid of the sine when solving an equation. Finally, let me talk about domain and inverses. To invert a function, I need to go back from the output to the original input. If there are multiple out inputs that lead to the same out as in a quadratic, then I have a problem. A function needs to be monotonic, always increasing or always decreasing, to be invertible. The quadratic x squared is not monotonic. It goes down and then it goes up. I can fix this, however, by restricting the domain. The domain of the quadratic f of x equals x squared is all real numbers. However, I can cut that in half and restrict the domain to only positive numbers, removing the negative side of the function. Now the function is increasing, and I can construct an inverse. The inverse is the square root, which is indeed only defined for positive numbers. This technique is very important, since it lets me find inverses for many functions which would not otherwise be invertible. It just requires being careful with the domains. This technique is particularly important for the trig inverses, since sine and cosine and tangent are not at all monotonic. There are standard restrictions to these domains, which are listed in the reference materials. Of one final note, the graph of an inverse is a mirror of the graph of the original over the diagonal line y equals x. You can see that here with the quadratic and the square root. They are the same, mirrored over that line, and this is true for all inverses.